The fourth Super Nintendo episode of my Nostalgia Trip Games starts off with a game I mentioned in the previous Nintendo 64 episode, Pilot Wings. The original Super Nintendo game has the same basic form, although certainly less material and styles of play. What it excelled instead was its sheer originality when it was introduced. No other platform had approached the subject of aviation in an even nearly similar manner. Taking a more arcadey and lighthearted approach to it all, with all sorts of stunts to accomplish with a few different sorts of devices. Pilot Wings came into my gaming life surprisingly late, as I hadn't really seen it in action before emulation came along, somewhere around 1998, 1999 maybe. And even then, I hadn't really given it much of a chance. I bought my own Super Nintendo in 2001, maybe 2002, can't remember exactly anymore. And I happened upon a relatively cheap complete in box version of Pilot Wings a year or two later. That forced me to finally take a good look at the game, and I was properly hooked on it for a few weeks. To be honest, Pilot Wings is not something that I come back to very often. But it's still a game I think fondly of whenever I get in the mood of playing some Super Nintendo games. It does have that sense of brilliance about it that none of the sequels seem to have, which I accredit to the sense of uniqueness the original had before the sequels came along, and practically ruined a perfectly good one-off. Next up, we have a rare occasion of a big league Super Nintendo game that was released in all three regions within the same year, all in 1994. I do believe this release schedule for Donkey Kong Country might have had something to do with the fact that it was developed by a British game developing team, Rare, formerly known as Ultimate Play the Game, but it's just a hunch. According to various sources, the story of the game's conception goes, Nintendo were planning on something to rival Sega's Aladdin, and called for Rare to revive the Donkey Kong franchise. Naturally, it's a platforming adventure that takes most of its elements from Aladdin, the Super Mario games and such, but the single biggest wow factor in Donkey Kong Country was the 3D modeled sprites that took platforming games one big step into the not-too-distant future. Like most big platformers on the Super NES, Donkey Kong Country and its sequels were not my favorites at any time, but then neither is Aladdin, so I guess they're on the same level in that sense. I did finish the first Donkey Kong Country once, although I cannot really remember much of the latter parts of the game, but it must have been good enough to have that one complete run. Come to think of it, the entire Donkey Kong Country series must be one of my least nostalgia trippy game series on the Super Nintendo, but I added the first one here just because I happen to have it in my collection. Well, of course, it cannot be denied that graphically Donkey Kong Country was something of a game changer in its time, and it didn't take long before games like Tomb Raider, Pandemonium and Crash Bandicoot started appearing on Sony's upcoming debut into the console market, while Sonic and Mario took their own proper leap into the third dimension. So yes, Donkey Kong Country certainly has its place in anyone's Super Nintendo library. The puzzle game choice for today is a Japan-only release based on the Japanese shonen manga series Ranuma Nibun no Ichi from 1995, Ogi Januken, which translates to something like Secret Rock Paper Scissors, which is pretty much what the gameplay is all about. The gameplay has perhaps more similarities to Sega's Columns than Compile's Puyo Puyo series, but you do need to deal with horizontal blocks of three tiles that look like the hand signals for rock, paper and scissors. In case you have for some unfathomable reason never played rock, paper, scissors, the original idea is to beat your friend with whatever your hands represented object is. Rock beats scissors, paper beats rock and scissors beat paper. So, 
In Okijanken, you use these rules to build up stuff and then take them down in order to throw some debris into your opponent's window. In addition to the regular RPS blocks, you have a couple of water buckets at hand which can be used to delete all the similar blocks from your window that you direct the bucket onto. Nanuma Nibu no Ichi Ogi Janken is not a game I have in my cartridge collection yet, although I have been looking for one from time to time. It's one of those games SJ and I found through emulation while exploring some, uh, let's say, questionable websites some 25 years ago, and remains one of my favorite puzzle games of all time. Around the same time, we found out about a very two-dimensional racing game originally released in the United States as Uniracers in 1994, but as Europeans had it in the following year as Unirally. If the name doesn't give you enough of a hint, you race with unicycles, and as I said, it's very much a 2D game that sort of resembles more Sonic the Hedgehog than Excite Bike or anything of that sort, although some of the visual effects are a bit three-dimensional. Uniracers, or Unirally if you prefer, is played in cops similarly to Mario Kart and such, and there are circuit races, stunt tracks, and uh, sort of segmented races that go from point A to point B. And as you make progress, the combination of stunt elements increase in the racetracks. You can play the game against a computer or another player in split-screen mode, but Universers offers so much challenge and fun to be played on your own that a second player is hardly needed, though the added fun factor cannot be denied. What I didn't know about Universers until doing a bit of research for this episode was that Pixar sued the game developing team DMA Design for the use of their unicycle design from the animated short film Red Stream, which seemed particularly preposterous as unicycles really cannot be drawn in too many ways. Therefore, the game only had its initial run of 300,000 copies before the deal with Pixar necessitated terminating further production. So, while it's not the most uncommon of games for the Super Nintendo, it might be considered something of a collector's item, which I'm perfectly happy to own. Last but certainly not the least, we're gonna have to take a quick look at the Super Bomberman series, of which only the first two were released in North America and only the third one in Europe, additionally to the original Japanese releases. The Super Bomberman series was published between 1993 and 1997 by various publishers in different regions, but it is very much a Hudson Soft property. The ones SJ and I played the most during our late 90s exploration period were the second, third and fifth games, and I only have the second and fifth games in my cartridge collection. What the original Super Bomberman managed to do was bring the proper name to Europeans, who had known the games thus far as either Dynablaster or Eric and the Floaters. Also, the original release of Super Bomberman was bundled with a multi-tap device, which allowed up to four players to connect to the same console, which then made the game's battle mode unleash its full potential. There's also a plot mode, which can be played in single-player mode or cooperative two-player mode, and you would get passwords to keep up with your progress. Super Bomberman 2 added a team battle mode into the mix, but dropped the two-player story mode. Not that it ever was much of a problem for us, because we never played anything other than the battle modes. Super Bomberman 3 brought in the possibility for a fifth player to join, provided that you had the more up-to-date multi-tap, and it also introduced the Yoshi-like pet creatures that you could ride and use them as single-hit shields of sorts. Also, what made a difference in the battle mode was that upon death, you would be moved to the borders, so you could continue throwing bombs at your opponents from the side. And then we get to the Japan-only releases, of which Super Bomberman 4 is largely unknown to me. According to Wikipedia, however, there are some notable new elements such as allies to be rescued who will then help you on your way, warps that can take you to different places, and various new battle game options. Super Bomberman 5 
is quite possibly the one we played the most around the turn of the millennium, because it featured all the good new elements from the previous Super Bomberman games, and with a certain code you could also change the battle mode maps. Even the single player mode felt more intriguing as it was now non-linear. But of course, all the Bomberman games can be considered suitable for different tastes. My current favorite might be Super Bomberman 3, but that's probably because I don't have it in my collection yet.